Well, we are, we're in uh, Galatians, and we're getting into chapter 5 tonight. We're going to be looking at Cal- uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And the title of our sermon is Stand Fast and Free in Faith. Stand Fast and Free in Faith. And we're going to walk through Galatians 5, 1 through 6, and some exhortations by Paul here. Paul is winding up his argument, and now he's going to start applying his argument uh, directly uh, to these believers in Galatia here who are having difficulty uh, with the law. And so let's start reading together in, in chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for the, the salvation that comes as a free gift of your grace through faith in Christ. Lord, protect us from this damning error of legalism, of falling into a, a trap, a snare of the devil, of looking at our own works, our own performance as a basis on which we're justified or righteous with God. And please protect us from that, Father, just the, those fiery darts from the wicked one. And please help us to see this clearly. Uh, It is a subtle, insidious sin. And God, we want to be free completely from it, to gouge it out of our lives. So Lord, where we err in this way, God, where we sin in this way, uh, please, Lord, draw uh, draw our attention to it. Uh, Convict us, Lord, by your Spirit. And uh, Lord, we pray that you'd grant us a repentance uh, from that so that we can follow Christ wholeheartedly by faith. Help us, Lord, where we spot this in our church to be loving and gentle about correcting this, reproving this, Lord, by your word uh, for the the glory of your name, uh, for for the salvation that we have in Christ. If we seek to attain righteousness through works of law, then the cross avails nothing. And to us, Lord, called by your name, your people, the cross avails everything. We praise you and thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the the sacrifice uh, for sins that he has so freely uh, given us. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are in Galatians, chapter 5, 1 through 6, and the the title of the sermon again is Stand Fast and Free in Faith. And the, the theme here that Paul's been working out, he has been working through this letter to the Galatians, um, working out the point that Christian liberty, Christian freedom... Uh, This idea of liberty in Christ comes to us on the basis of faith in Christ, uh, in faith only. All men, and this is an important point that I think we've established, Paul has established in working through Galatians, all men apart from Christ are in bondage. They are in slavery. The only true freedom, the only true freedom that's available, period, end of story, is the freedom that we have through repentant faith in Christ. Everything else is slavery, is bondage, and certainly this effort to attain righteousness through works of the law or attain right standing with God based on your performance, that is bondage. It is slavery. Outside of Christ, we're in bondage to sin. Romans 6, verse 16 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? We are in bondage, apart from Christ, to an accusing conscience. Um, And worse, slavery yet, if our conscience isn't accusing, right? Uh, We're in bondage to an accusing conscience outside of Christ. We're in bondage uh, under the oppression of judgment apart from Christ. Romans 2, verses 5 and 6 says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. That doesn't sound like freedom, does it? Doesn't sound like liberty. That doesn't sound like joy in Christ. That sounds like oppressive bondage to judgment. 
But we're also, if you're apart from Christ, and you're trying to escape God's wrath, you're trying to escape judgment, then you're in bondage, you're in slavery under the law. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Romans 7, 9 through 11 says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Now, there is no freedom, no liberty under the law. And if you're outside of Christ, you're in bondage. You're in bondage to your sin. You're in oppression under an accusing conscience. You're under oppression of judgment of God. You're in bondage, in slavery to the law if you're trying to establish your own righteousness to be saved. And under that law, you're under the curse. Galatians 3.10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. You're in bondage to the curse. You're in slavery to the curse. You're under the oppression of the curse of God if you're seeking to establish righteousness by works of the law. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Do you see, outside of Christ, outside of the liberty that is available in Christ, outside of the freedom that comes in Christ, you're in bondage, you're in slavery, you're under oppression. And it's amazing to me, but sometimes genuine believers, we have difficulty with understanding what this freedom, what this liberty in Christ really is. Uh, it's something that needs to be explained. What is freedom? What is freedom? Here, Paul is making the point that we need to stand fast in the freedom that we have in Christ. Stand fast and free in the faith. So what is this freedom? In Romans 8, verses 1 and 2 there is therefore now no condemnation. That's one aspect of freedom. You come to Christ, you're no longer under judgment. You're no longer under condemnation. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So when you come to Christ, you're in Christ, you're walking by the Spirit, then you are free from the law and sin of sin and death. And that is freedom. When you, born in sin, in your depravity as children of Adam, by your nature depraved, unable to please God, unable, unable to live for God, unable to escape wrath on your own, when you come to Christ and you are now free from sin and death, free from condemnation, that's freedom. That's freedom. And that's the only freedom that is free. That's the only freedom that is necessary. That's all we want, right? And to those that don't seek or understand the value of that freedom, they're blinded. They're blinded by their own sin. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And they're just treasuring up for themselves wrath in the day of wrath, thinking they're free, to, they're thinking they're free because they're living their lives for themselves. But we, when we were outside of Christ groaned, didn't we? If you're a disciple of Christ, before you came to Christ, you groaned under the weight of your sin. At some point, you came to grips with your slavery. You came to grips with your bondage. You realized the veil was lifted, your eyes were opened, and you realized that you are in slavery. You're under oppression, that you are under judgment, you're under condemnation. Uh, you groaned under that fearful expectation of judgment, didn't you? And that was one of the things that God used in opening your eyes, opening your heart to understand the gospel. One of the things that God used to convict you of your condition, convict you of your sin, so that you could be saved. So you came to grips with that bondage um, of your sin. But until we were set free from this bondage, of this oppression, the only freedom that we were able to have is freedom in Christ that comes through repentant faith. Wesley wrote a hymn, and I thought these words were appropriate considering what we're talking about here, this freedom that we have in Christ, this bondage that we're in under our sin. And he wrote, Come, O my guilty brethren, come, groaning beneath your load of sin. That sounds oppressive, doesn't it? Sounds like you're in bondage, and you are. If you're outside of Christ, you are in slavery to sin. Come, O my guilty brethren, come, groaning beneath your load of sin, 
His bleeding heart shall make you room. His open side shall take you in. He calls you now, invites you home. Come, O my guilty brethren, come. For you the purple current flowed in pardon from his wounded side. Languished for you the eternal God. For you the Prince of Glory died. Believe and all your guilt is forgiven. Only believe and yours is heaven. Praise God. Um, Praise God that in Christ you have all of your guilt relieved. All of your guilt removed. All of your sins forgiven. You are cleansed in Him. You have all of that burden lifted. Uh, You have the weight and oppression and bondage of your sin taken away in Christ. There's freedom in Christ. And that's the only freedom that counts is only found in Christ. Uh, Otherwise, it's bondage and oppression and slavery. And here, just shockingly, and we'll see more as we walk through this passage why, but here the Galatians want to abandon that freedom. They have this freedom that comes only through Christ, and they're turning their backs on it. But we need to take a look at what this freedom is. Defined in our understanding, when we think about freedom in our context and our understanding, freedom, the way we know it, is basically doing whatever you want to do when you want to do it. All right? That's just sort of defining what freedom is. Uh, If I'm free, I want to eat. Well, I'm going to eat what I want to eat, and I'm going to eat when I want to eat it. (laughs) And I partake of that freedom more than I should. However, that's that's free. (laughs) If you're free to eat, you're free to eat. You can eat what you want to eat when you want to eat it. No one's controlling your choices there. Um, You want to see a girl, you you go see that girl. And you see the girl you want to see, and you go see her when you want to see her. Because you're free. You have the ability to do whatever you want to do. You think you're free, and so on the second date, you decide you want to marry that girl. You ask her to marry her, you get married, and now you're in slavery. She doesn't turn out to be what you thought she was going to turn out to be, and you're back in bondage again. Uh, The the freedom that you think you have is not the freedom that you really have. Freedom in that respect is an illusion. Um, And you figure out, married to this girl, that freedom that you thought you had not cracked up with it not cracked up to be what it should have been. Um, The only true freedom that we have is the freedom that we have by faith in Christ that comes with being a child of the kingdom, being a child of his. When you are walking by faith in accordance with the spirit, in accordance with your new nature that God gave you in Christ, that is freedom. And that produces joy, love. It produces the fruit of the spirit. It produces patience and perseverance. And that's what genuine freedom produces. Real freedom, I want to give you an example of this. Now remember, freedom that we have in Christ is walking according to the Spirit, all right? Freedom in accord with the Spirit and in accord with the new nature, walking by faith in Christ, living the Christian life in that way is true freedom. You come to to Christ by repentant faith. You turn from your sin, put your trust in Him. Living the Christian life, you focus on him, you keep your eyes on him, you walk this life by faith in Christ, right? And you're doing that under the power, under the control of the Holy Spirit at work in you, because when you're saved, God gives you his spirit. And then you're doing that in accordance with the new nature that God has given you. And in that, there's great freedom. The result of that is freedom. Now think about it this way. You got a business owner that wants to hire a guy to make sales calls. And he's got two options. One guy absolutely loves to make sales calls. All right? And the owner wants him to make sales calls and wants him to make a lot of sales calls. The other guy that he has the option of hiring hates to make sales calls. Doesn't want to do it. So not a tough choice for the owner here. The one who loves to make sales calls is free to make as many sales calls as he wants. Right? Because he loves to make sales calls. The owner hires him to do that job. He's free to do that job. In his job, he experiences freedom in that because he loves, out of his own nature, loves to make sales calls. The other guy is in bondage, right? If he hires the guy that hates to make sales calls, that guy is going to feel enslaved in his new job. He's going to feel in bondage, under oppression. Okay, keep that in mind. We're going to work that out as we go forward here. Without faith in Christ... Without walking the the Christian life according to faith, without trusting him, without walking under the control of the Spirit, through faith, there is no freedom. Freedom, even for the disciple of Christ, comes not simply by a 
of forensic justification at the beginning when you were saved, freedom for the Christian is experienced by walking in accord with the Spirit, in accord with your new nature, by faith in Christ. And that freedom, that experience of freedom in the Christian life is sustained by faith in Christ. As soon as you step away from faith, uh, you deny that freedom that is yours in Christ, and you start putting yourself under bondage again. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about by way of experience. We'll talk about that more. Our freedom as Christians is a product of our new nature. In the same way that the one guy loves to make sales calls, it's in accord with his nature to make sales calls, he's going to love sales calls. The guy that hates sales calls is going to be burdened and enslaved and in bondage because he hates to make sales calls. It's not in his nature to love sales calls, so he's going to be enslaved. Our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus is a product of our new nature, right? The liberty that we have in Christ is a product of the new heart that God gives us. If, you're, if you don't have a new heart, then for all of your effort, for all of your trying, for all of your intensity and energy devoted to try to live the Christian life, you're simply going to be in bondage. Uh, you're not going to be free. As an unbeliever, you simply are not going to have victory over sin. You simply are not going to have the joy that comes from this liberty that's in Christ. Uh, you simply aren't going to overcome. And that is because you're not a believer. You don't have the new nature. Freedom as Christians comes as a product of our new nature. And that's why in the Christian life that his commands to us are not burdensome. To the guy that's making the sales calls, that loves to make the sales calls, are the instructions of his boss to make sales calls, is that a burden to him? No, because it's a part of his new nature. He loves to make sales calls. To the guy that's groaning under the weight of sales calls, when he reads his contract and he says, okay, i got to make all these sales calls, that's a burden to him. There's no joy, there's no freedom in that, okay? Uh, that's why when you're a Christian and you're walking by faith, you're walking in accord with the new nature, um, his commands are not burdensome. Think of that girl, all right? If you love the girl, does anyone have to tell you to go talk to her? Does anyone have to prod you, to goad you, to go spend time with her? <laughs> no, you're itching for every opportunity to go spend time with her, to go talk to her. Um, no one has to goad you to do that. But sometimes, even as a, as a Christian, we've got to be reminded of that, right? Even as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ, you're putting off the old man. You are like an old, rustic piece of furniture, and you're stripping off the old varnish so you can lacquer it up nice and shiny over here, right? Sometimes that old lacquer, that old finish has to be sanded off. And we need to be reminded sometimes that we have freedom in Christ. Sometimes, just like these Galatians, we can slip into patterns of thinking or patterns of living that can look like the old you, look like the old man. And that's why it's so important to be in a good church around brothers and sisters to encourage you uh, to study letters like the letter to the Galatians to help you with that. Um, to exhort you daily, to stir you up to love and good works, to remind you to keep your eyes focused on Christ and walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh, because in that there's real Christian joy. But if you're like me, there have been times when you can slip into uh, that introspection we've been talking about or that morbidity that we've been talking about where the joy of your Christian life is just siphoned away uh, and it's because we're not walking by faith. We're not walking in the liberty that is already ours in Christ, that is ours by repentant faith in Christ. And as soon as you stop walking in that faith, in that liberty, then joy is gone, victory is gone, um, the work of the Spirit sanctifying you is gone. Uh, that ends, and joy ends, freedom ends, and you're back in bondage again. So let me ask you, examine yourself right now. Are you burdened by his commands? Is there something about your Christian life, your service to him, your walking the Christian life that is burdensome to you? And you've got a couple of options there. One is you've slipped back into trying to establish right standing with God based on your own achievement. Or number two, you're lost. Because when you come to Christ, you have freedom in Christ, victory over sin, power in the Spirit, 
joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all as a fruit of the new life, as a fruit of your new nature, as a fruit of the liberty that is ours in accord with our new nature, all by faith in Christ. And so if something about your Christian service isn't, is a burden to you, isn't generated out of love and affection for Christ, doesn't bring you joy in serving your Lord in that way, then it's something to look at. Either one, you have slipped back into the same sin that these Galatians have slipped into that Paul is seriously rebuking them for, or you're not a believer and you need to come turn to Christ and call out to him for the freedom that comes only through faith in Christ. But are his commands a burden? Do you lack joy? Do you have difficulty or are you having difficulty overcoming sin? Now, to the genuine disciple of Christ, um, there is sin that you will battle your whole life. But the Bible promises victory. The Bible promises progress. The Bible promises an upward direction. The Bible promises observable progress. Are you just wallowing in the mire? Have you returned to your own vomit? Are you just wallowing in that, or do you see that observable progress? Do you see that substantial direction of righteousness in your life as a result of the Spirit, or are you just wallowing in your sin? No victory over sin at all. Are you trying to be free and you aren't changing? If so, you may need to turn to Christ and ask Him for deliverance. That's the deliverance that comes through repentant faith in Christ. When you're in Christ through repentant faith, there is liberty and there is freedom. There will be victory. There will be progress. Albeit ultimate progress only comes when you leave this life, when God takes you home. But there will be progress. Not the perfection of your life, the direction of your life. The direction of your life is observable change. The direction of your life is observable righteousness. The direction of your life is a hatred for sin and a joy and a fulfillment in serving Christ, a love for him, a love for his commands. And so it's, it's worthy in a situation like this, especially under the, the rebuke that these Galatians are under here, to examine yourself and to see, am I in the same, the, the same boat? We need, we need true freedom, and we need true freedom in Christ. And here, in Galatians 5, the Galatians want to give that up. The thing that we want is liberty in Christ, freedom in Christ, And the Galatians want to give it up. Look at verse 1. Stand fast, therefore. This is an imperative command from Paul here. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Now, Christ's work is summarized here. And it's summarized in two ways. One is through an indicative statement. We've talked about that before in Greek. Indicative is a statement of fact. And the fact is, is that you are free from the law in Christ. If you are a disciple of Christ, then you are free from the dominion of the law in Christ. The imperative as a result of that indicative, the imperative command is now stand fast in that freedom. Don't drift from that. Don't turn away from it. Uh, Don't fall. This is paramount to the sin of apostasy here to turn away to turn away from that freedom to turn back to the law is tantamount to apostasy to turning away from the faith okay this is like the sales guy imagine telling the sales guy now who absolutely loves to make calls loves to make sales calls imagine telling him now okay i want to hire you into this job over here and in this job over here it's the same job You got to make sales calls, all right? But you, in this job over here, you get to make 600,000 sales calls a day. (laughs) Might as well be 600 billion, 600 million, 600 trillion, okay? Over here, you just make sales calls. Over here, we want to hire you into this role, and you need to make 600,000 sales calls per day. Or you keep your job over here, and you're just free to make sales calls. Okay, you see the analogy a little bit? Over here, you're free to make calls. Over here, you you make calls, but you got to make 600,000 a day. Um, The law does that. Under the law, there is no freedom. You have to perfectly keep all of the law 
And it might as well be like that guy making 6 million sales calls a day, right? It's impossible. Under the law, there is no freedom to keep the law. There's only bondage. There's only slavery. There's only oppression because you cannot keep it. Like the passage in James, if you break one of the laws, you're guilty of breaking all of the law. But over here, you're free (laughs) and you're free to keep the law in Christ. Over here, the law is a yoke in Acts 15. Turn to Acts 15. Let's take a look at this. The law is a yoke. It's a burden. It's oppressive. It's bondage. It's slavery. And look at Acts 15. We're going to get here in a couple of weeks um, on Sunday morning. But in Acts 15, in verse 1, this is a synopsis of this. We're talking about the same situation here. Verse, chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. They caused caused great joy to all the brethren. When they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles, the elders. They reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. Now this is the the situation that they're dealing with here in the letter to the Galatians. Circumcision is used as reflecting the entire law. Here they're specifically, in this passage, specifically speaking about circumcision, but that is reflective of if you keep the law regarding circumcision, you've got to keep the entire law. Look at verse 6. Now the apostles, elders, came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, speaking of uncircumcised Gentiles. Verse 10, now therefore, why do you test God, and here it is, by putting a yoke, a burden, an oppressive bondage, a slavery, on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. This law is bondage. It's a yoke of slavery. It's taking the guy who loves to make sales calls and putting him under the bondage of making 600000 a day, right? See the, the, the difference there. One sense, he'd be free. The other sense, he's in bondage. Christ frees and liberates the Christian from that yoke. When you come to Christ by repentant faith, you are freed from that yoke of bondage. There's no longer the impossible law to keep in order to be righteous before God. Now you are free in Christ to just simply out of a loving heart obey him. And there is no longer the burden, the slavery, the oppression of trying to establish perfection because that's what is demanded. Perfection on the basis of your own effort in keeping the law. Um, That's simply bondage. And Christ has set us free from that bondage. Christ frees and liberates. The law enslaves and holds captive. The Galatians here are foolish. They're making a foolish mistake. It will turn out to be fatal to them if they continue down this path. And Paul here is going to give a a scathing warning about that. Freedom to the Galatians is already theirs. If you're in Christ, freedom is already yours. You've already been removed out from under the yoke of that law. You've already been removed out from under bondage, out from under slavery. Now you are free. Think about the guy making sales calls. If you get the job, you have the job where you just get to make sales calls, then you are free to make sales calls. Why would you ever want to Take the job over here where it's required of you to make $600 million a day, all right, and 300000 of those between 9 and 9.30 in the morning. I mean, that would be foolish. That's idiotic. 
That comes out of the stupidity of our own flesh when we do that, right? You wouldn't do it. Freedom is already theirs. Now, I want to make a distinction there. That's not freedom to sin. That's not freedom to sin. Like we talked about in the very beginning, that true freedom is by faith in Christ, under the control of the Spirit, walking in accordance with our new nature. In that circumstance, you won't be slaves to sin. The pattern of sin simply ends because it's been broken by that reality. Based on faith in Christ, under the control of the Spirit, in accord with your new nature, you're not going to be wallowing in your own vomit over here. There's going to be victory over sin. It's not freedom to sin. It's freedom to do what your new nature wants to do. If you're in Christ, then your new nature hates sin and wants nothing to do with it. If you're free in Christ, by faith in Christ, then your new nature wants to obey him wants to please him. And your obedience, your love for Christ, your affection for Christ, it all pours out of the new heart that God gave you, okay? Um, the law simply will not cure the desires of a heart that has no interest in the things of God. If you are outside of Christ, and all of this is just a burden to you, it's all just hard work, you know, human achievement, trying to grit it out, and you just don't have any victory over sin, and your sin, 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 your attitude, your, uh, the affections just aren't there for Christ, the law will never cure the desires of that kind of heart. What you need more than anything is a new heart. What you need is a new heart in Christ, and that is through faith in Christ, and that new heart is free. It's, there's freedom. We need to stand fast in that freedom. Look at verse 2. Here, uh, the law in verse 1 uh, is a yoke of bondage, Look at verse 2. Indeed I, behold, I, Paul. This is serious business. There's about to be immense weight to this statement. This is unvarnished truth. This is direct. This is pointed. Indeed I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Bet says, a commentary says that Paul here in this statement mobilizes all of his apostolic authority to make this statement in verse 2. This is weighty. This is, a, this is not a matter of opinion. This is not inconsequential. It's not a light thing. This is a weight. This is serious business. And we're going to see their eternity is at stake here. If they fall back and rely on circumcision, they're falling back to the entirety of the law. And that entirety of the law there is going to condemn them. Here, circumcision, circumcision relates to the whole law. Look at Romans. Let's see an example of that. Romans chapter 2, and look at verse 25. Romans chapter 2, verse 25. Here's an explanation of that from Romans. For circumcision, verse 25, is indeed profitable if you keep the law. Do you see that? But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, Paul says, matters nothing. But if you are going to keep the law, and if you're going to be circumcised, then you're saying you're going to keep the entire law. Verse 27. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he's not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Those who hold to circumcision and fail to observe the whole law become like uncircumcised Gentiles. If you hold to circumcision and fail to observe the entire law, and that's good for nothing. You're like an uncircumcised Gentile. You're going to go to hell when you die. That's the point that Paul's making here. Paul teaches that no one can keep the whole law. And because no one can keep the whole law, the circumcision profits nothing. Now, profit there, that word profit, profits them nothing, is related to eschatological judgment. It's related to last day's judgment. In the sense that keeping it profits you nothing means eternal torment. If it profited you anything, it would profit life, but it doesn't. It profits you nothing. If the Galatians here 
submit to circumcision, we know what circumcision is, literally the word here is that they cut themselves off. They cut themselves off from the only means by which they can be forgiven of their sins, and that's through repentant faith in Christ. Uh, imagine the sales guy now. The sales guy hired into the job in order to make 600,000 sales calls a day. If he doesn't make the 600,000 sales calls in a day, he's fired. Well, think about that for a second and relate the two. He's got a job over here where he's free, but he takes the job over here where he has to make 600,000 sales calls a day, and if he fails to make all of those calls, and it might as well be 600 trillion, then he's fired. He loses his job. When he was over here and free, he had job security, right? But now he places himself under this yoke of bondage, this yoke of slavery over here, and if he doesn't do it, if he doesn't get the job done, he's fired. That means it profits you nothing. For him to put himself over here profits him nothing. He's going to be fired. You get it? There is no hope for him to make those calls. Over here, he was free. So why? I mean, why, after being free over here, would you ever come over here and do this? It just doesn't make any sense. It's not making any sense to Paul here uh, either. The point here is that the Galatians believe somehow that there's, that there's profit in circumcision for salvation. Somehow or another, they've got their minds mixed up, tangled up, rat's nest in there, thinking that there's some kind of profit uh, in circumcision for salvation, okay? Then, if they believe that, now apply this to yourself and your own thinking, if you believe that, that there's some kind of work, there's some kind of human effort, human achievement, whatever it is, performance, that profits you something, then there is no saving benefit that comes from Christ. The saving benefit that you had, that you thought you had from Christ, is not there any longer. You are cut off from the saving benefit that you thought you had in Christ. Uh, you can't have both. You can't have freedom and the yoke of the law. You can't have faith and works. They are mutually exclusive, all right? And so back in Galatians chapter 5, you can only have one or the other. And there is a huge chasm between the two that cannot be crossed. This is mutually exclusive. Uh, there's simply no way, no way to do both. Uh, back in Galatians 5, look now at verse 3. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Okay, so let's think about our sales guy. Over here he was free, but now he takes this job to make his 600,000, 600 million, 600 trillion sales calls a day. And they say to him, well, I tell you what, I mean, I know it's a lot, it's a lot of calls, but if you make five calls between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, that's okay. We'll let you make five phone calls between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, but if you make those five phone calls between 9 and 9.30, you got to do the 600 trillion. But you can do the, the five between 9 and 9. See the stupidity of that? The same thing with the law. Listen, you can come over here and you can do this one little thing of circumcision. You can be circumcised. Or in Galatians 4, when they were keeping the Old Testament calendar days. You can come over here and keep this portion of the law. But what Paul is striving to bring to the forefront of their understanding is that if you think that way, sure, you can be circumcised but you got to keep the whole law. Sure, you can keep the Old Testament calendar days, but that's not where that ends. You've got to keep the entire law or it profits you absolutely nothing. Now here in verse 3, he uses the, the language, and I testify again. It's like Paul in a courtroom. It's got a courtroom feel here, and it's very serious. This is oath language. This is covenant language. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that if he becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the entire law. This is covenant language here, and we're talking about two different means of salvation. One is perfect obedience to the entire law of God, perfect righteousness, or Christ, the cross, his finished work. One or the other, neither one, you can't have both together. They're mutually exclusive. Um, and it says in chapter 4, verse 21, before when we looked at this, that they actually desired, they were desiring to be under the yoke of this bondage. They 
wanted it. And so somehow in their minds, they were joyful about it. Uh, They desired that as if that were favorable to them. And Paul here in verse 3 views that as great debt. If you remember just by way of example or analogy, the parable of the unforgiving servant, the unforgiving man, he had this insurmountable 10,000 talents, I believe it was, insurmountable, un, almost unimaginable debt that he was forgiven, that he was forgiven. In the same circumstance here, the Galatians, if they are outside of Christ, then their debt is unimaginable to keep the entire law. That's outside of Christ. The Galatians are professing to be in Christ, and they desire to go back under that debt and attempt to pay it. It's just utter foolishness, utter stupidity, utter foolishness. This is the same thing when you are in faith in Christ, you are free in Christ, and you attempt to return to slavery in legalism, slavery in works righteousness, attempting to make right with God in your own performance. It's the same kind of thing. You're returning to this unpayable debt. And that's the way Paul is viewing it. Verse 3, he becomes a debtor to keep the whole law. It's, it's with well, that sales guy, is might, it, it might as well be 600 gazillion phone calls because 600,000, 600 million, it, it's all the same. There, it's an impossibility. And here with the Galatians, it's being made clear too that their animal sacrifices are not going to help them any longer. Because Christ has come, that sacrifice no longer works in the way that they thought it worked. Now there's Christ, and so if you leave faith in Christ and attempt to establish righteousness with God based on your own efforts, you don't have the animal sacrifices to help you. It's all on you. It's all according to your own performance. They can't fail. They can't even fail in one point. And to fail in one point of the law is to lose it all. Now, you can't have the law and Christ. And if they fail in the law, they've lost Christ. If they make that transfer, Christ is gone for them. And verse 4, this is no veiled threat. Look at verse 4. You have become estranged for Christ. Now, that, again, that word there is severed, cut off. And we're going to see this more and more here as we walk through Galatians. They're severed from Christ, cut off from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. If they try to be justified by law, then they've abandoned the grace, the Christ of the Gospels. They've abandoned Christ. Literally here, this is a warning against apostasy. It's like Hebrews 10, Hebrews 6. This is so serious. And this is why this needs to be so serious in your life and in my life as we walk the Christian life, not to trail or stumble into, fall into the sin of legalism. Because in departing faith, it is so serious to fall into legalism and performance, human effort, human achievement, that it is tantamount to the sin of apostasy. If you depart the faith for works, you're departing Christ, and you're departing the grace that comes only in Christ. Law and grace are polar opposites. Law tries to find righteousness in doing, and it you just obey. The righteousness, the freedom that's in Christ finds righteousness only in Christ and he walks by faith. And that's what the Christian life is. These Galatians, if they accept circumcision, if they accept the law in this way, they're abandoning Christ. They're abandoning the grace that is in Christ, the Christ of the gospels. They're abandoning the faith. That's why it's, it's apostasy. Now think about this way with the sales guy. The sales guy who loves to make sales calls, mind you, now is told by the owner of the business, listen, this job over here, it's not the one over here where he's got to make 600 million phone calls. The sales guy making phone calls over here, he's got this job. He's free to make sales calls. Now the owner tells him, listen, this job is yours forever. It's yours forever. Make, you're free to make sales calls. Make sales calls. Be free to make sales calls and you'll never lose your job. You'll ne- you have job security forever. That's what we have in Christ. That's a, f- a feeble, forgive me, all right? A feeble, stupid analogy, and you can't take it too far, it'll break down. But think about it. You, out of your nature, love Christ. 
you, out of your new nature, just want to obey him, just want to please him. You want sin out of your life. You hate sin. You want to study the word of God. You love the word of God. You want to live for him because you want to please your Lord. And that's out of your heart. You want to do that. And over here, you've got the job forever. You're going to be serving Christ for all eternity. And you're free. You're just free to live for him. You're free out of your new heart, out of your new nature, just to love Christ, just to serve him. Just free in grace, free in Christ. There's just joy. You've been saved. Your sins have been forgiven. You've been cleansed. And you're just free to live. And it's yours forever. You are a son of the kingdom. You have an inheritance. It's eternal. No one will snatch you out of his hand. You will persevere to the end because Christ God preserves you. It's yours and it's yours forever. Or you can come over here and take this lousy deal over here where gritted out in your own effort, in your own power, and you've got to keep up with all the rules and regulations. Make sense? It's just, that's the grace that we have in Christ. That's the liberty that we have in Christ. It's the freedom that is in Christ. And oftentimes, even as a disciple of Christ, we get, it's hard, it's sometimes difficult to keep that clear in our minds, to understand that. It's so easy to fall into the ditch of legalism. Now this over here, you got to also avoid the ditch of license. It's not freedom to sin. And you need to be striving against sin. You need to be gouging sin out of your life because out of your heart, you want to serve the Lord. It's like Paul in Romans 7. Over here, you're saying, wretched man that I am, I want free from this body of death. And you're struggling and striving against sin. But you're free in Christ. Um, think about this with your own life. How does this apply to you? If you're the disciple of Christ that you know, loves to make the sales calls, and you've got the new nature that God has given you, the new heart that God has given you, then are you, or in what way are you, trying to derive justification with God based on your performance? And in what way have you? And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, uh, you're probably familiar with what that looks like, how that feels, what that smells like. I mean, you can see it coming because you've been there before. But in what way do you attempt to derive justification with God based on your performance? Uh, you must trust only and completely in Christ, uh, by faith in Christ. It simply cannot be done any other way. Look at verse 5. For through the Spirit we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. When you're saved through repentant faith in Christ, you're made justified. You're made righteous as part of conversion. The, the justification, the imputed righteousness of Christ. Here, what he's talking about is the final eschatological last day declaration of God that you are righteous. And that's the day that all genuine believers hope for. There's great hope. In the meantime, while we're here, we eagerly wait for that declaration. We eagerly wait for that day, and we walk by the Spirit in faith, trusting in Christ. And here, between verse 4 and verse 5, uh, there's a contrast that's hinted at. In verse 4, you've become estranged, cut off from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You've fallen from grace. And then in verse 5, 4, we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. There's an implied or a hinted at um, contra uh, contrast there that basically states that true believers will not be estranged from Christ, will not be cut off, uh, nor will they defect from grace. A genuine disciple is going to persevere till the end. The grounds of that contrast are believers, rather than trusting in their own efforts, trusting in their own obedience for righteousness, continuously look at the grounds of their hope, which is Christ Jesus, by faith and the power of the Spirit to live the Christian life, to be pleasing to Him, to obey. It's the, the disciple of Christ is preserved and persevered in obedience, which is the fruit of faith, through the Spirit's work, through faith in Christ. And again, in accord with your new nature. It's the way it works. It's not the flesh. It's not self-effort. It's believing in Christ, believing in the hope, eagerly awaiting the hope. Um, it's living for Christ. Uh, and this is, again, it's a looking away from yourself. 
If you're a disciple and you have this hope in you, uh, then you're not looking at yourself. You're looking to your hope, which is Christ. You're looking at the cross. You're looking by faith at Christ. You're living your life looking at Christ. It's not an inward focus. It's not a self-focus. It's a Christ focus. Um, that, looking at Christ and living that way, is a product of the Holy Spirit. It's a product of your new nature. It's a product of regeneration. It's a product of being a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Uh, it's not produced by human willpower. It's not produced by how much you try, how much you bear it or grit it out. It's produced by the Spirit. And so if it's going to be produced in you, you've got to walk by faith in Christ for it, depending on Him for it. So again, you know, it, 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 putting an overarching understanding on what the Christian life looks like, if you are walking the Christian life by faith, then everything comes through faith in Christ. You need to overcome sin. You want to gouge sin out of your life, you turn to Christ. And by faith in Christ, you cry out to God for help in overcoming that. Uh, you want to you know, more faithfully serve in this area, or you want to be stronger in this area, or you have a need in this area. It's all done by focusing on Christ, not on yourself. You want assurance of your salvation. Assurance of your salvation is going to come through perseverance over time by faith in Christ, and the, the obedience, the performance is going to be a fruit of that. As soon as you take your eyes off of Christ, and you're no longer living by faith in Christ, then performance and assurance go out the window, because you're not walking by faith anymore, you're walking by your own effort. And so it's this looking at Christ, this looking to our hope, this eager waiting, this expectation, all is an outward focus. It's all focused on what Christ has done for you, what is available to you in the cross, what our final and eventual hope is, the final and eventual declaration of our righteousness in that day, all of that is an outward focus. It's just not, it's simply not focused on you at all. And in verse 6 here, we're going to see that that ends means everything. Look at verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love means everything. All right? That's what's implied there at the end of that verse. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Now, lest someone like these Galatians or someone else take pride in their uncircumcision, Paul tacks that on together to say, listen, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. None of that means anything. But faith working through love, it means everything. But faith working through love, that's the substance. And faith here working through love, some take that to mean that faith is the fruit of love. Like you've got to be loving, and then out of being loving, faith comes completely. It's a Catholic and a wrong way of looking at that completely. Here, love is the fruit of faith. And there's a couple of places where um, we make sure that that's understood clearly. In Galatians 5, love is a fruit of the Spirit. Walking in faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, love is a fruit of the Spirit. Love here is a fruit of faith. It's a fruit of the new creation. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 7.19, this is interesting if we compare the two. In 1 Corinthians 7.19, it says, Circumcision is nothing... And uncircumcision is nothing. Do you see the comparison there? But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Are those two things contradictory? Uncircumcision is nothing. Circumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Here, Paul's trying to establish that it's faith that matters. In 1 Corinthians 7, 19, those things harmonize perfectly well together. Keeping the commandments is a fruit of faith. It's faith alone that saves, but as the Reformers said, it's not the faith that is alone. If faith without works is dead. So faith alone saves, but it's not the faith that is alone. Here, circumcision doesn't mean anything. Uncircumcision doesn't mean a hill of beans. What matters is finding righteousness in Him. And if you are a disciple, you hunger and you thirst for righteousness. And in hungering and thirsting for righteousness, are you going to come over here and take the deal where you bear and grit that out in your own effort, in your own energy, having to keep all of it? Or do you step over here in the freedom and the liberty that you have in Christ? And Paul is telling you here with all seriousness, mustering up all his apostolic authority to tell you, take this path. 
This leads to death and damnation and apostasy. This leads to life eternal in Christ. Take this path and by faith in Christ, seek the righteousness. You hunger and thirst for righteousness? Hunger and thirst for righteousness as you should and do that by faith in Christ, uh, not in your own power, not according to your own efforts. Now here, it's interesting, this whole connection with apostasy. If the Galatians continue down this path, they go apostate. They never were saved to begin with, and they go to hell when they die. If you, if I persist in a, a, a morbid, introspective, self-performing effort to maintain or attain right standing with God based on our performance, and we just fall into that legalistic trap of I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and you're doing that in your own effort, then the warnings of Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10 are for you. The warnings here that Paul is giving these Galatians are for you. Um, he's warning them to stay away from that path. Uh, this is the grace of God in this warning. The warnings of Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10 are a grace of God. Those warnings in Scripture are how God helps the believer persevere to the end. Those warnings are to rouse up in you fear. And they, they have. I remember the first time I came across those passages of Scripture. I mean, it, I had knee-knocking fear over those passages. Does this apply to me? Is this, you know, they can create, and that's exactly the intention um, they help, they assist the believers stay on the right path. Here, Paul's admonition here, his warning to these Galatians is the same thing. It should cause you to fear legalism, to fear taking your eyes off Christ. Everything that you have, everything that you hope for is wrapped up in Christ. And so if one, for one second you think somehow that you've got to grit it out in your own effort, you need to cling to the cross that much tighter. Uh, turn to Christ that much tighter. This is a warning. Fall away from Christ and be damned. And we need to keep clinging to Christ, keep trusting in Christ. Um, this should warn us to turn from this morbidity that's associated with our performance. Uh, turn from obsessive perfectionism. Um, if that's difficulty that you have or something you get tripped up on, it's just the opposite. You turn away from performance and you turn yourself to the cross. You turn yourself to Christ. I read um, Luther on this passage and I just, I love what Luther said. I'll read this to you. It just sums this up really well and see if this applies to you, if you've ever experienced this before. Luther said, this is a very important and pleasant comfort with which to bring wonderful encouragement to minds afflicted and disturbed with a sense of sin and afraid of every flaming dart of the devil. Now think about that. If you've ever been afflicted and disturbed, uh, inwardly focused, introspective, morbid over a sense of your own performance, a sense of sin, and afraid of every flaming dart of the devil, then this, these words from Paul here should be a very important and pleasant comfort with which to bring wonderful encouragement to your mind. Right? He goes on to say, your righteousness, if you're in Christ, your righteousness is not visible and it is not conscious, but it is hoped for as something to be revealed in due time. It's a glorious promise we have in Christ. Therefore, you must not judge on the basis of your consciousness of sin, which terrifies and troubles you, but on the basis of the promise and teaching of faith by which Christ is promised to you as your perfect and eternal righteousness. The only perfect and sure and true righteousness that we can ever have is in Christ. And so when you, as a disciple, find yourself torn up and wrecked uh, over some circumstance, what's the, the resolution to that? You look by faith to Christ, and Christ is promised to you as your perfect and eternal righteousness. The only righteousness that you can have, the only righteousness to you which is available at all, and it's the righteousness that you have to have to be right with God, 
it's only available in Christ and in Christ alone by faith. If you try to secure it any other way, the end of that road is certain death and certain damnation, a, a fearful expectation of judgment. So that's why it's so important. And this is Paul's warnings here in Galatians 5, so critical and so weighty because that's, it's such a serious sin. If you walk a Christian life, we need to walk a Christian life by faith in Christ who is our righteousness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you, Lord, for Christ. Just so, Lord, in awe of that amazing gift. Lord, we're so unrighteous in and of ourselves, God. And you're so merciful and so gracious, Lord, that in Christ we have the perfect righteousness that you demand. God, help us keep our eyes focused, glued on Christ. Help us, Lord, to just embrace and cling to the cross and praise you, God, that you've given us the righteousness that we have in Christ, Lord, that we have the hope of that one day final declaration on that day of righteous in him. We praise you, God, and thank you for that hope. God, thank you for that promise. And we know from your word, Lord, that those are promises are just as sure as if they were already in the past. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for this salvation. God, keep us focused on Christ. Keep us faithful to him. Keep our eyes glued on him. Lord, not trying to reestablish or trying to attain some kind of righteousness on our own, just something in our flesh, Lord, that wants to wickedly bend that direction. But Lord, protect us from legalism. Protect us from that wicked sin. And just keep our eyes, God, focused on Christ. Lord, help us by your spirit walk this Christian life by faith, God, and attaining the promises that we have in your word. We praise you and thank you for them, for your glory, God, and for your eternal praise and worship. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.